Well, here's something you don't see every day. I was looking for something completely different on AliExpress and I came across the Thomson Lightning Strike Counter. Easy to install and maintain. Available in a selection of colours. They all have the same feature. They've got a, a reset button. They've got a three-digit display that can count up to 999 lightning strikes. And... Uh, they're available with the white front or the diffused. I went for the diffused. I also went for the red display because the red LED is more reliable, fundamentally. And this device basically gets used in conjunction with a SPD, a surge protective device like this one. And you put this around the live conductor, or potentially, I suppose, if it's going to Earth, you could put it around the Earth conductor. The instructions are vague. But wherever there's like to be a high current pulse, that wire goes through the sense transformer and then through the unit. And in the event of there being a huge power anomaly, this device kicks in and it shunts a spike, it will theoretically increment the display by one. Now I can power this up and we can look at the uh, electrical characteristics of it. Runs at, well, 220 volts, it's official designation. You can see it's the little display there. Not ter terribly bright, but bright enough. Uh, the power consumption is 0 0.09 watts. So say 0.1 watt. Um, the current is about 3 milliamps. And the power factor is uh, something around 0.1, which does suggest this is a capacitive dropper in it. It's very low current. It's not really... It, the power is so low, it's just not going to actually have any significant uh, effect on your... Your bill. Now, I have tried things. I've tried press the button for a very long time. I tried powering it on press the button just to see if it did anything. I tried getting a whopping great big magnet and pulsing against this. No, I couldn't get it to actually count, but we'll take a look at the circuitry. And that way we can actually see what it is actually expecting there. I'd guess there's going to be a great big shunt resistor. This alone, uh, if I unplug this now, keep in mind, I did actually also consider getting a battery and dabbing it across here, but this will be reference to the mains. The power is off, but this current sense transformer has quite a low resistance. Let me bring in the meter, set it to 200 ohms. And this is a uh, not really surprising, actually. And it has a resistance of about 18 ohms. Very low impedance for a, a current sense transformer. Anyway... I'm going to pause momentarily because this thing is held together by rivets, unfortunately. And when I start try to drill these rivets out live, they always end up starting spinning inside the housing. So I shall open it and then we can uh, resume from that point. One moment, please. So pausing to drill the rivets out was a good idea. The rivets themselves drilled out easily, but the case is held together with plastic clips as well. And they did not uh, let go so easily. It tends to come across part with loud cracks and bangs and stuff shooting out everywhere but we have the bit we're interested in which is the circuit board here and I can see that it's divided into two sections well three sections technically speaking we've got a little power supply here with a 47 nanofarad dropper capacitor interesting input protection circuitry uh, a rectifier and smooth capacitor on this side on the uh, the sense coil side Unexpectedly, there's an opto-isolator after a bridge rectifier uh, and a, a shunt diode. Interesting. I think it's a shunt diode. And then we get the little microcontroller in the front, which they've scrubbed the number off so we can see the top secret microcontroller. And it's driving a little three-digit display with a few um, random filtering type functional components. Let's reverse engineer it. So I shall do that right now. One moment, please. Reverse engineering is complete. Quite an interesting circuit. But before we look at that, let's get this right up here. Uh, power on. Zoom down a little bit and I'll show you it counting. So I'm going to emulate voltage transients by bridging this capacitor. So there's your first voltage transient. Add a few more. Lots of voltage transients. And then most importantly of all, I'm going to turn the power off. The power is off completely, power comes on, and it restores the value. So it has non-volatile memory. Okay, let's get down and take a look at the schematic now. Well, let's take a look at the circuitry. I shall turn this off. It's very obvious from the circuit board that it wasn't always, or maybe they just thought they could use a cheaper chip. 
or maybe they've upgraded, uh, they've rubbed the number off it. Don't know what it is, but it doesn't really matter. It's going to be a very, very basic microcontroller. It's not doing anything too fancy. Let's start with the circuitry for the power supply. We have, I'll zoom down a little bit. The incoming uh, supply, the 220 to 240 volts, comes to this little uh, PTC thermistor. It's a fuse, a, a self-resetting fuse. And it then is connected to this metal oxide varistor across the supply lines, as I'm showing the schematic. And then there was this yellow uh, capacitor, and I took the capacitor off because there was circuitry hidden underneath. Um, and it's got a couple of discharge risks across it. Very good. That that then goes, it forms a capacitive dropper. There's a bit of direct fire. 470 ohm resistor, and then really oddly, instead of a Zener diode, they've used a, a transient voltage suppressor, rated 5 volts. That's very strange, and a big, fat capacitor that is clearly designed to allow it to finish saving a transient increment before the power goes off if it's been a lightning strike and it's blown all the power out. The sensing circuit for the coil is a uh, very interesting... I had a hunch that maybe I might have been able to trigger it with a 9-volt battery and a resistor. I wasn't too keen to start faffing around lots of wires because I thought it would probably be referenced to the mains. It's not. And my idea would have worked, actually. So the coil comes in here. I'll just draw that on. Here is the sense coil. Current transformer. And there is another uh, transient voltage spread across it, rated 10 volts. Then a bridge rectifier to detect whichever polarity it is a current limiting resistor, and then an opto-isolator. The opto-isolator is a little capacitor across the output of it just for filtering, uh, and then it leads to the processor. The circuitry here that's mostly missing, the 5 volts generated over this circuitry doesn't go straight up to the uh, microcontroller. It comes to here, and it goes through a 10-ohm resistor, and then a diode, and then there, but it also goes to here, where they've had what uh, is presumably been the battery connection in the past, and that 10 ohm resistor would have trickle charged that battery. Um, but for that reason also, when the power fails, if there was a transistor here and a couple of resistors and a Zener diode, they've not shown it as a Zener diode, but it would have to be a Zener diode, then this circuitry tells it when the power supply has failed before... Um, well, so it knows that it's now running on battery and it can basically go into standby mode and turn the display off. Very straightforward. Let's take a look at the processor card. I think I've covered everything here. Yes, I have. It's quite nice, particularly that little self-resetting high-voltage thermistor is very good. It's Tom's and their stuff is okay. Let's uh, zoom down a bit. Here's the seven segment display. The uh, segments are being driven by seven of the lines and the digits are all being powered from another three lines via 510 ohm resistor. So it's a multiplex display. We've got a couple of decoupling capacitors just for local supply stability and then three pull up resistors, one for the pulses, one for the uh, loss of supply indication from the transistor that's not there and one for the switch, which the switch also is debouncing across it. And when you press the button in that thing, it just basically resets to zero instantly. There's no sort of, you don't have to hold it for a time. It just resets instantly. Let's take a look at the schematic, which is in two pages because it's actually, well, and the first page also has three bits of circuitry on it. That's a bit intense. Let's start off at the very beginning. There's the cute little PTC. It's a WMZ12A75HP, or WMZ if you prefer. Then there's a metal oxide varistor that's just ominously just marked 360. Hmm, not sure what that means. Normally I'd expect them to be rated like 471 for a 240 volt supply, but maybe it's just a generic metal oxide varistor. There's the little class... Uh, X2, 47 nanofarad capacitor. I guessed it was going to be 100 nano, but it's even lower. It's very low power, this unit. All it is, is ultimately um, just a, a counter and dis multiplex display. And the red display, although I'm guessing this is a high efficiency display, uh, it I chose the red because it's the most rugged technology. I could have chosen blue or green or white, um, and they'd be even brighter. 
rather splendidly, it has two 330k resistors across that capacitor. That is something nice to see. Normally they just put a single resistor across, but because this is Tom's and the stuff is better, they have the two resistors. Excellent. There's a bridge rectifier, a 470 ohm resistor, the big fat 470 microfarad 25 volt capacitor, and then that really odd TVS, 5 volt TVS. And I'll write what it's a... Uh, it's got a number. Well, it's got a very cryptic number. It's AE. AE. Likewise, this 10 volt one down here is called AX. I'll write that on as well. AX. AX. X effect. So this produces roughly 5 volts. That's It's really odd using that. As I've mentioned before, I'm not sure how good it is for actually producing a stable supply. But anyway, it produces that supply voltage and will drop down to this bit of circuitry first. And that goes to the microcontroller. I've just shown it as MCU plus via a 10 ohm resistor and a diode. And that's presumably for uh, limiting the current to charge the little battery that's normally across there, which is not shown. I've shown a capacitor. I could have shown... Uh, no, I'll just leave it as it is. It's fine. The components shown in orange are not on the circuit board. These values I've written in are ones I've guessed. 3.9 volt, 10k, 100k. The transistor, Y1, anything, just generic NPN transistor. And the idea is that when the supply presence, supply voltage is higher than the zener voltage and the 0.6 volt of the base of the transistor, uh, current will flow, turn the transistor on, and it pulls that uh, input line low, um, and uh, signals that the power's there. And when the power fails and the voltage starts dropping, it will then say, you know, you've lost power. You're running strictly on the uh, battery. I feel I should actually show. I'll just show every battery like that. There we go. It would be multiple cells. The current transformer. Let's take a look at this. Let's unravel the current transformer and see what's inside. It's held together with blue tape which is liberating its blueness and uh, it's just a little toroidal core very straightforward nothing particularly fancy about that I do have a feeling that is that hold on let me look at it through a magnifying glass with my old man eyes no, no, this is a solid core it's not it's not the type of the look of it I don't think so, unless it's got extra insulation, but it doesn't look like a type that's basically a spiral of steel. It's quite impressive that that, uh, well, I suppose it's like basically a thousand amps passing through the middle of it in the event of a fault, that it can generate enough to be clamped to 10 volt and then drive the LED in the opt isolator because that's what it does. So here's the coil, this coil here. There is a 10 volt uh, transient uh, suppressor, which basically it's be a bi-directional Zener diode. It will clamp it in either direction. Then there's a bridge rectifier based on discrete diodes. And the output then from that uh, goes via 1K resistor and through the LED in an EL817 opto isolator to the main board. Let's take a look at the main board. Interesting circuitry. Very interesting circuitry. Here is the, the brains of it, this little module here. It's really not. The microcontroller, they've switched to the non-volatile type, but they could use it the cheapest, absolutely. All it has to do is scan this display and occasionally just read, well, just while it's scanning, just check if one of the inputs is pressed, either the opto isolator, which indicates that a transient has been detected, or the button that's going to reset the display. So here's the supply coming on. There's the two capacitors, the filter capacitors. There's the three 10K pull-up resistors. One is for the power OK signal that would normally be pulled down by the transistor, but isn't there. Uh, but it's little 10K pull-up resistor is. This is the pulse detection. So the opto isolator here has a capacitor across it for filtering and uh, it's normally pulled up to the positive rail by that 10k resistor. When a transit occurs and the LED is pulsed, it basically shunts down. And if it's this is a bit of filtering, it will then uh, signal to the processor to count one more and increment the counter. Then there's the reset button, which is a 10k pull-up resistor. The switch going to the zero volt rail and then a capacitor across it just to basically filter it. So there's no sort of 
well, it's debouncing. It's a very simple way of doing that. Not that the reset button really matters because ultimately it doesn't matter if it bounces because all you're doing is resetting the display to zero. And there is the uh, seven segment drive lines and then the digit via the three 510 ohm resistors. And that is it. Really quite a, an interesting little unit. I wonder how effective they are in detecting those and how would you really determine your, uh, I mean, this is a British General transient uh, suppressor. It's a surge protective device, SPD, and inside is just big metal oxide varistors and a sort of thermal cutout device for safety reasons. But um, I wonder how you can determine this thing is going to give you a rough indication that it's being exposed to X number of pulses. How would you know at what point you should really change the module for a new one? I'm not really sure. I suppose if you let it go the full cycle to the point that it finally triggered and actually uh, tripped its little flag in there, then check the counter. You could in the future one just basically order a new one in just before it reached that time. Interesting. But that's it. Uh, it's an interesting little module. It's quite a neat little module um, and super low power, which is nice. And uh, just something I'd never seen before. It was just quite an unusual little item and very pleasing. <laughs>